from a shared vision. The Cerebras founders united to build the unimaginable. They believed they could build something better to create the largest, fastest chip in the world. Wafer scale integration was once thought to be impossible, but Cerebras turned the impossible into reality. The largest chip of its kind, it stands as a testament to human ingenuity and ambition. A chip to power supercomputers and drive the forefront of AI capabilities. Wafer scale engines are the biggest AI chips, now powering the biggest AI supercomputers for the most challenging AI workflows. Fueling advancements across industries, science, and global innovation, Cerebras isn't just shaping the future of AI, it's inspiring the next generation to continue to imagine, innovate, and inspire. Cerebras is powering the future of AI with our revolutionary compute. Designed in Silicon Valley, assembled in America, built for the world. Together, we can push the limits of what's possible. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the one, the only, CEO and co-founder of Cerebris, Andrew Feldman. Thank you guys for coming. It's uh, so nice to see so many people here. Um, in 2016, in March, five guys got together and we, we thought we could build a company. We thought that AI would be an interesting workload. Right? We, we, we were wrong. It's not an interesting workload. It's not the most interesting workload of our generation. Right? It may well prove to be the most interesting generation in the history of the computer industry. And that's where we're going right now. Now, AI, the expansion of AI, as everybody in this room knows, has produced unprecedented growth. And it has sort of fundamentally altered computing. We've moved from a world in which software was running on a single computer to supercompute performance. This has a really interesting ramification, and we can see it taking shape right now. It's creating haves and have-nots, those who can and those who can't, those who can afford big clusters, those who can't, those who can afford giant teams of AI practitioners and those who can't. And we'll talk a little bit about how that unfolds and how at Cerebris we're here to solve that problem. AI developers are struggling with distributed compute. And I, I, I don't want you to believe me. I know it's unusual for a guy to stand up and say, don't, don't believe me. All right, just r read what used to be Twitter, right? Read the smartest software and ML guys you know of. Ask your teams, all right? Ask them if they're frustrated every day trying to do big distributed compute to get their big models over hundreds or thousands of GPUs. Nobody's smarter than Andre Karpathy. He's a pioneer in our field. It's hard for him. All right, it's hard for your teams, it's hard for our teams. This is a painful problem. Yi Tay, also not a dope. Ivan Zhao, we, we could put hundreds and hundreds of these up, of people who are practitioners, are the best at their, their business, and struggle. But I don't want you just to listen to what they say, I want you to watch what they do. Okay. This is GPT-1. It was 120 million parameters, four people trained it. Four. Now GPT-4, 240 people were involved in training it. 35 just for doing distributed compute and just for supercompute wrangling. Okay. And this is for a very, very simple reason. It's hard, and it's hard because big models don't fit on GPUs. Okay, it, it's not complicated. 
It's when your model doesn't fit on a GPU, what do you have to do? You have to cut it up. And when you cut up models, what does that mean? That means you have to spread them out over GPUs. And what does this do? This means you've got to write a lot of software to allow them to communicate with each other, to tie back together. And what have you done? You've turned an AI problem into a parallel computing problem. You've taken AI, right, and made it distributed compute, and you've turned compute infrastructure into supercompute infrastructure. And this is brutal. And what does it mean to your teams, to the people who are doing this? What it means is they go from what fit on one processor, about 600 lines of code, to tens of thousands of lines of code. Right? This is to be avoided at all costs. <laughs> right? This is the death of productivity. All right. This is what you never need to do with us. This is why we exist at Cerebris, is to help you avoid the problem of distributed compute. And how do we do that? We do that by building chips that are big enough to hold the entire problem. It's just that simple. Build really big chips, except nobody's ever done it before, that can hold the entire problem. So this is why we announced last week the largest chip ever made, not by a little bit, by a lot. Thank you. I, I, want, I want you to notice that I'm not doing this. All right? Everybody see, everybody see what I'm not doing? All right? This is 46 thousand square millimeters of silicon. This is four trillion transistors. It's not two chips taped together. All right. This is a single wafer with the largest square possible cut out of it. This is 900,000 AI cores. This is 125 petaflops of AI compute. Now, as students of history and no longer being young, we can take a big view. And every chip in the last 52 years has followed the same trajectory. Okay. They followed the trajectory of Moore's Law. Except us. All right. Every chip for 52 years is on the white line. And we're on the, the orange line. Now, if you'd like to know where NVIDIA will be all right, in 10 years, I can show you. It's where we are now. All right, that's Moore's law continuing on to get them four trillion transistors. All right. Now, what we're going to do is just pause and stare at my favorite slide of my career. So we're just going to stand here for a little while, and we're just going to admire this slide. This is our chip. This is an 80 billion transistor. Sad, small, lonely GPU. Now, we don't just build chips, we build systems. And to go build a system, you have to put together a package, you have to cool it, and we became experts over the course of the last eight years in packaging and cooling. And this is the saleable unit, the CS3. Now, the CS3 uh, has some unique characteristics and includes some technology that is not in the original chassis. It includes a memory appliance called MemoryX. It includes a fabric called SwarmX. Now, the memory appliance allows us to go from terabytes to petabytes of memory, even on a single machine. It allows us to go from one machine to more than 2,000 machines in a cluster. It allows us to go from 125 petaflops to 256 exaflops in a cluster. That's a quarter of a zettaflop. It allows us to go even on a single machine from a billion parameters to 24 trillion parameters. Now, exascale performance is cool. But single device simplicity is a theme you're going to hear throughout today. 
you program, whether it's one machine or 2,000 machines, you program it as if it were a simple single machine. All right. This is why not only have we been able to build supercomputers at a tremendous rate, here's one, here's a different one, and we'll talk a little bit about a third. Uh, anybody know what you begin with, with when you build a supercomputer? Anyone? Electricians. All right. That's what you see here. This is Stockton, California. This is a, a facility of ours. Um, and you begin with electricians, and then you bring in truckers who are moving pallets and forklift operators. Let me show you a little bit about what it looks like to build a, a four exaflop facility. American rock and roll. Sixty-four systems, CS2s, four exaflops of compute. Stockton, California. Now, what we announced last week was we had just started with our strategic partner, G42, an eight exaflop supercomputer based on the new part uh, in Dallas, California, in uh, Dallas, Texas. Um, Dallas, California would be an interesting political environment, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we give them Orange County. <laughs> uh, uh, in nine months, we will have stood up two four exaflop supercomputers and an eight exaflop supercomputer in Santa Clara, in Stockton, and in Dallas. Now, we then use this compute to do interesting things. And we use this compute with all the benefits we're bringing to our, our, our customers. We train not tens, not hundreds, but thousands of models. And here's an example. Working with G42, we trained the world's leading Arabic English model. There are 400 million native Arabic speakers. There wasn't a model for them. Okay, we trained this model. It outperformed every competitor by heads and shoulders. Microsoft has taken it. It's now the foundation of their Middle Eastern service served off Azure. We've also partnered with Mayo Clinic, and they will be here in a little bit. You'll hear directly from them to build models to drive better outcomes in healthcare. Right, healthcare is 17% of GDP. If we can't use AI to do better there, what are we doing? Working closely with, with Mayo, they have some of the, the great data sets, medical data sets in the world. We achieved HIPAA compliance, so we can work directly with this extraordinary patient data sets. We do an extraordinary work with them. Energy, energy is 12% of the economy. Our partnership with Total Energies has dramatically improved their exploration function. And you see here, we were able to do just a little bit faster than their existing GPU infrastructure. Right? Orders of magnitude, not one, two. Uh, oh, this is Tony. Uh, t Tony uh, was president of Calst. This was a world record. In this case, our team worked together with them. They borrowed 48 of our systems and we outperformed 37,000 GPUs in the largest supercomputer on Earth in Frontier. 48 of our machines. So whether it's extraordinary models, whether it's world records, right, these are the results you get when you have huge compute that's easy to use in the hands of, of people who are uh, driven to produce interesting results. And this is why last year we booked a quarter of a billion dollars. You can clap at that. Okay, 
so what we're going to do for the rest of today, you're going to hear from our customers, you're going to hear from my co-founder, Sean, and we're going to dive deeper and hopefully uh, have a little fun afterwards, all right? All right, thank you for coming, and now we'll turn it over to Sean. All right, hey everyone. I'm Sean, and I'm really excited to give you guys all a deep dive into the CS3 hardware architecture. The Cerebra CS3 system, it's our third generation wafer scale system. And it's a generational leap in AI compute because it gives you two times higher performance than our previous generation, but at the same power and the same price. Let me show you how we do that. Starting with the foundation, the compute core. And here, we're building on top of the tried and true previous generation WSC2 core. that had 48 kilobytes of memory and a four-way 16-bit data path. On top of that, we are improving performance for AI compute substantially. First, by improving to an eight-way SIMD 16-bit AI compute data path, and also a brand new 16-way SIMD data path for 8-bit AI compute. Now, this is going to accelerate the matrix multiplication of neural networks. But as we all know, neural networks are not just matrix multiplies. So we've also added new instructions to speed up nonlinear functions. And in aggregate, together, we are able to deliver two times higher real-world performance per core versus our previous generation. Now, on the memory side, we've improved the local cache to 512 bytes to be able to feed the wider data path and higher performance. Together with the local memory, we are able to get full memory bandwidth for full SIMD performance. Now, that's something that is simply not possible with the GPU memory architecture. So next, what we do is we take this small core and we tile it out 10,000 times into a die. You can think of a die like a traditional chip. Then we tile out 84 of these die across the entire wafer for an aggregate of 900,000 compute cores on a single piece of silicon, a single massive chip. Now, we are uniquely capable of this wafer scale integration because we invented this process in our first generation wafer scale engine. And now we've improved it and we've extended it to the five nanometer process in collaboration with TSMC. Now this is only possible because we've co-designed this from the ground up, from the uniform tile and fabric architecture that allows us to, <clears throat> to fill the entire wafer with the fabric, extending the fabric beyond a single die to a cross die. These are the little blue lines on this diagram. And ultimately, that's what enables the entire wafer to behave like a single massive chip. Now, these little blue lines, they are a big deal. And the reason is when you compare with a traditional chip-to-chip -chip interconnect, for example, how H100 GPUs are interconnected in a DGX server, the difference is just vast. On the wafer, we can connect together 10 times more die or chips at 33 times more I.O. bandwidth. And all of it is 100 times more power efficient. And I'm not even including the MV link switches in my calculations here. Now, the reason we can do that is actually Pretty simple. And that's because when you compare how you drive bits across uh, between die in the traditional interconnect, you're driving bits through connectors, through printed circuit boards, sometimes even through cables over long distances. That's just significantly harder and more power consumption than on the wafer, where we're driving bits less than a millimeter of distance on silicon. And this is what enables us to treat the entire wafer like a massive chip. 
So what we did was we take that massive chip and we built a system around it. We call it the CS3 system. And it's purpose built for wafer scale. Now when you compare that with GPUs, the performance numbers are just mind boggling. With this level of performance, we can enable large scale training on a single chip. For example, you can fine tune the popular LAMA 70 billion parameter model from an open source checkpoint for a billion tokens in just a day on a single chip. 70 billion parameter model fine tuned in a day on a single chip. Now, we didn't stop there. We built a cluster of these CS3s, and we built the entire cluster so that it was designed as a single ML accelerator. Now, the reason we're able to do this is because the WSE3 is big enough to run even the largest models on a single chip. That's what allows us to disaggregate the compute and the memory, and we can train with data parallel only scaling. You can think of this as <clears throat> a cluster level memory and a cluster level compute that we've architected specifically so the entire cluster natively behaves like a single device. The way we do that is we put all of the model weights in an external memory called memory X. And then we stream these weights into the CS3 system to program the compute. Now, this is only possible because we have specialized hardware mechanisms in the wafer that trigger the compute as the weights stream in. The weights are never stored on the wafer, not even temporarily, so they never use any of the capacity of the wafer. You can think of this as a specialized memory hierarchy capable of massive models on a single device. Next, we scale this out using a specialized fabric we call SORMEX, and it's purpose-built for data parallel only scaling. It has built-in broadcast and reduce mechanisms. And since we're just replicating multi-system scaling, it's the same as running on a single system. It's the same architecture, it's the same execution flow, it's the same software interface. You get scaling to cluster level compute, but it operates like a single device because it's data parallel only. So in our previous generation cluster, the CS2 cluster, we supported up to 192 CS2 systems in a single cluster. Now that was a lot. But now with the CS3 cluster, we support 2,000 CS2, CS3 systems in a single cluster. That's 256 exaflops of FP16 AI compute. And it all programs like a single device. It's beyond supercomputer performance, but single device experience. Now what enables that is we've significantly upgraded our physical interconnect to be able to scale out. We've upgraded the physical links to 400 gigabits and 800 gigabit links up from 100 gigabits in the previous generation. And all of this is standard-based ethernet because it's high performance, it's flexible, it's cost-effective and doesn't have any of the challenges of custom proprietary interconnects like MVLink or InfiniBand. We also use standards-based RDMA for low overhead and low latency. And when you aggregate all of this together at 2,000 CS3 systems, we have an aggregate cluster bandwidth of 10 petabits per second. It's 10 times more than the previous generation. With that amount of compute, you can train today's state-of-the-art models in just hours or days. For example, the popular LAMA 70 billion parameter model that was trained by Meta on a large GPU cluster took about a month to train. With the amount of raw compute in the CS3 cluster, 
we could train that model in about a day. And what's more, the entire cluster operates like a single device. On the memory side, in our previous generation CS2 cluster, we supported up to 12 terabytes of memory in the memory X unit, which supported 240 billion parameter models. Again, that was a lot. But now in the CS3 cluster, we are supporting petabyte level memory, up to 1.2 petabytes of memory for 24 trillion parameter models, 100 times larger than the previous generation. Now that is only possible because we use hybrid storage for the weight memory. And here, all the weights are stored in DDR5 DRAM and flash memory because it's high performance, it's power, and it's cost effective. In the CS3 cluster, excuse me, the memory X unit can support up to 36 terabytes of DDR5 DRAM, which supports 720 billion parameter models, and up to 1.2 petabytes of flash storage for 24 trillion parameter models. Additionally, the memory X unit also has compute to run things like weight optimizer and other miscellaneous functions within the, the model. And here we've also improved the compute of the memory X unit by 2x to keep up and to be able to feed the CS3, which has higher performance. This level of memory is more aggregate memory than some of the biggest GPU or TPU clusters today and it's all accessible from a single system. With this level of memory, coupled with the compute, we can train tomorrow's trillion parameter models in just days or weeks. Imagine training a one trillion parameter llama style model on thousands of GPUs that would probably take over a year to train. Virtually impossible. On the CS3 cluster, you can train that in three weeks. And the whole cluster behaves like a single device. As a user, the entire cluster always looks like a single device, no matter the cluster size, whether it's one CS3, four CS3s, or 2,000 CS3s. It always looks like a single big device. And your, your model always fits. Doesn't matter if it's a 1 billion parameter model, 10 billion, 100 billion, trillions of parameters, your model always fits. It always looks like a single big device. And this is a real world example. This is G42 training their state of the art 30 billion parameter model on the Condor Galaxy 1 cluster. And as you can see, whether they were training on one system or 64 systems, it was linear scaling at any scale while operating like a single device. It just worked. There was no complex distribution software, no changes to the parallelism model, no changes to the hyperparameters. It just worked. And we are really proud that this unique capability has been enabled by the wafer scale architecture because it's enabling our users and our customers to train state-of-the-art models every single day. And for me, as a computer architect, this is really exciting because what's enabling all of this is a core design philosophy that we have at Cerebris, and that's to right-size the solution to the problem. Now, some of you may have heard yesterday our GPU friends. Um, they announced, proudly announced, that they can now connect two die together. It's a big deal for them. This is our chip. In fact, that's our third chip 
where we can tie 84 dye together on a single piece of silicon, a single massive chip. Now, what's really important here is that you can't get there incrementally. You need to take a different approach to be able to get to the scale where the magic happens. You need a certain scale before you can avoid the external chip interconnect that's low performance, high power, uses proprietary chips for switches. Two die is not going to get you that, not even close. On the wafer, we can run with an on-chip only interconnect and essentially get free high performance communication. You need a certain scale before you can remove and avoid that complexity of distribution software and hybrid model parallelism distribution. On the wafer, the wafer is big enough to run even the largest models on a single chip so that we can scale with data parallel only scaling and disaggregate memory and compute. When you right size the solution for the problem, everything just works better. And that's the reason we built a massive chip to solve the massive problems in AI today. But we believe we can and we need to do even better than this. And the reason is simple. Gen AI is exploding at a rate that is unsustainable. If you look at the last five years, from BERT to GPT-4, the amount of compute needed to train the state-of-the-art model has increased by 40,000 times in five years. 40,000 times more compute to train one model in five years. Clearly, this is unsustainable. And so we, as a community, we have to find more efficient methods. And at Cerebrus, we believe sparsity is the key. Now, why is that? It's because neural networks, they're sparse. There's natural sparsity in neural networks when you use common techniques like ReLU or Dropout that introduce a bunch of zeros into the computation. And it turns out that even dense layers of neural networks, they could be made sparse. And that's because models are over-parameterized by design. In fact, you can think of the act of training a neural network model as discovering which of the weights are important and which are not. That's sparsity. So training dense is inherently wasteful and inefficient. But not all hardware can take advantage of all forms of sparsity. And the reason for that is because sparsity acceleration is fundamentally memory bound. All right? And the reason is that dense matrix multiplies, they have a high degree of data reuse, which means you can use techniques like local caching. What this means is you can read a row from the matrix from memory, put it in a local cache, and use it a bunch of times before having to go back out to memory. A dense matrix multiply only requires on the order of 0.001 bytes per physical flop of memory bandwidth. And GPUs, they have that level of memory bandwidth, so they can run dense matrix multiplies. Sparse matrix multiplies, on the other hand, are a completely different story. There's very low data reuse, and so you can't use traditional caching techniques. At the extreme, you have to read each of the rows from the matrix from memory for every sparse element. And therefore, you need order 1,000 times more memory bandwidth per physical flop to be able to run all forms of sparsity. And that's level of sparse, that level of memory bandwidth is not possible with traditional techniques. Only with the wafer scale engine architecture are we able to get this level of memory bandwidth. And this is the reason why the Cerebrus CS3 
is capable of accelerating all forms of sparsity. Static or dynamic, structured or unstructured. We can accelerate all forms and translate that into training speed up. Here's some examples. We can accelerate dynamic activation sparsity. Last year, Google published a paper showing that over 95% of the FFN layers in large models can be sparse through ReLU sparsity. That's 1.7 times fewer training flops overall. We can accelerate structure sparsity. As an example, Mistral recently released a mixture of experts model that is running 75% sparse in the FFN layers. That represents about a two times reduction in overall training flops. We can also accelerate fully unstructured sparsity, like what we at Cerebris are developing, where we've shown you can induce up to 75% sparsity for up to 2.8 times less training flops. At Cerebris, we believe it's that only through hardware that can accelerate all forms of sparsity, like the ones I mentioned, and even future forms of sparsity that haven't yet been invented by the community, can we really solve the problem of unsustainable training growth? Thank you very much. Now, you might be thinking, sparsity can accelerate training, but can it also help inference? It turns out it can. And in fact, sparsity can enable inference on a variety of hardware, including CPUs. And so at Cerebris, we've been collaborating with Neuromagic on doing exactly this. And so next, I'd like to introduce you to Mark Kurtz, who's the CTO of Neuromagic, who's going to describe the work we've been doing together to enable sparse inference models on CPUs. Mark? Hi. Thank you, Sean. Hi, everyone. My name is Mark Kurtz. I'm here to talk over some of the research collaborations that we've been working on with Cerebris. But first, a little bit of background on who we are and uh, what we're doing. We're a Series A startup based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, and built on top of some leading research that was pulled out of MIT. Specifically, we, fo we focus on model optimization and being able to utilize that through software to uh, inference faster. On top of that, across our entire team, we have over 200 plus research, uh, research publications as well as 60 patents on top of our technology. We even invented many of the state-of-the-art um, state -of algorithms that you may have already used. This includes sparse GPT and GPTQ for large language model compression. Our solutions include enterprise-ready uh, inference software and inference serving software, including what we're calling for now, NMVLM, which is focused on GPUs as well as deep sparse, which is focused on CPUs. And finally, we have sparse ML, which is what we push out for our open source research, all productized and ready to use on top of, uh, on top of what we have available. Finally, in the same vein of collaborations with Cerebris, we like to collaborate with others as well. We just launched a partnership with Akamai last week. And additionally, we've pushed out great, great results with AMD in the past. Now, diving in a little bit more into deployment of LLMs, specifically because we've talked a lot about the size of the models and the issues that we have with training them, these issues compound as companies move into deployment. Specifically, the size of these models require lots of compute, lots of memory, and ultimately increase the latency for us being able to deploy applications for our users. This means that it's very demanding on our inference software and especially on our serving infrastructure. Ultimately, to get down to the latencies that we need, this means it becomes expensive to operate and expensive to support. The options include 
the options to try and remedy this currently include trying to reduce the model size or quantize, talking, so talking into decreasing the size of the LLMs. We can see that going from a 70 billion to a 7 billion parameter model can significantly reduce the accuracy and potentially push it outside of what might be possible for the applications we're trying to deploy. Even utilizing the state-of-the-art research for N4 quantization, currently, we can take that 70 billion model and it's still gonna be two and a half times larger than a seven billion parameter model that's unoptimized. So this sets up a problem, which is do we need to scale our models down, accept the accuracy loss, and therefore uh, deploy an application that may not be relevant to our users. And this is where we started pushing with Cerebrus, which is exploring sparsity. So we're gonna take a neural network, if it's quantized or not, we're going to remove the connections that are unimportant, and this is specifically because, as Sean said, while training, these connections allow us to explore a large optimization space. But at inference time, we've already converged on that. So there's a ton of redundancy left over in these networks that we can completely remove. So with unstructured sparsity, we can come in, preserve the model accuracy while reducing the size and ideally, getting the best of both worlds. Next, we can then use this to improve our inference and training performance. Talking through our research collaboration with Cerebris, we set out on a core goal, which was to be able to create open source, sparse models that both enterprise and the community can utilize within their own applications for inference speed up. Looking through the process, we started with our Llama 2 pre-trained models for Meta, applied our sparse GPT algorithm to create unstructured sparse versions of these models. The unstructured sparsity is important here because any kind of structure that we add on top of these models immediately reduces the accuracy. Even something as simple as block structure with 2.4 means that we are no longer achieving the same accuracy at the same sparsity level, and we need to significantly scale back that sparsity. Now, after creating those unstructured sparse models, we need to retrain them a little bit. And this is because we've diverged, especially at the highest sparsity levels that we're trying to achieve, we've diverged from what the original model was. And this is where Cerebrus became so core to our problem. Their ability to be able to speed up sparse training, specifically on unstructured sparsity, meant that we could have anywhere from 1.7 to 2.4x reduction in flops. This all translated to savings for us in terms, of, uh, in terms of total cost to train these models, but more importantly, we could iterate faster on these problems. So this results in our sparse foundational models. Specifically today, we're launching 70% uh, and 50% 50% sparse Llama 2 7 billion models ready for the community to use. All of these recover to within 90% or better of the original baseline accuracy. But the next step was to take those and then see what it does for actual use cases for these pre-trained models. So specifically, we took those foundational models, fine-tuned them onto a set of specific use cases and then quantize them with our GBTQ algorithm. We focused on chat and code generation to start off with. And again, we created 50% and 70% sparse versions of these models. So let's dive into the results on these models and talk a little bit more about what that means. To our surprise, and a lot of hard work that went behind it, we actually were able to get full recovery at 70% sparsity we were able to remove almost five billion parameters from those models and still match the baseline. It's a significant reduction in size. This is in contrast to doing this with our sparse GPT algorithm on its own, where at 70% sparsity, these models become unusable. Now let's look at memory, right? And especially in combination with the industry standard event four. We can see our 70% sparse models 
are able to compress much more than our int4 weights. And specifically, at FP16, we were able to reduce that memory by 4.3x. Coming back to our process, as I said, these models are all available. And additionally, we pushed out all of the code and all of the research into our open source uh, repositories so you can take those sparse foundational models and fine tune them onto your own use cases. Next, let's look at what that means for an inference use case then, right? Because this was our entire goal, to try and improve that performance. Specifically, we'll start off with local inference. We're looking at an eight core AMD Genoa system and what the performance looks like. For a single stream, we end up hitting 20 tokens per second on that eight core CPU. Beating out, the int4 standard of llama.cpp. But additionally, looking at our single stream latency, right, our time, our time to first token, we can see the, um, the immense drop that we have with that 70% model, and in combination with activation quantization, this now makes, ultimately, real-time chat available for your local devices, including laptops, desktops, whatever you need to use. Diving into a server setup, we took a 16-core system and compared it to a standard setup with an A10 GPU. As we can see here, for single code or uh, single stream decode performance, that CPU system is able to beat a standard setup on an A10 GPU, enabling a lot more flexibility on top of that. Even diving into a multi-stream case where it is more GPU friendly, we can see that the 70% sparse model is competitive with that GPU. This is looking at 32 concurrent streams and how many uh, tokens we can generate per second. So ultimately, sparsity enabled us to allow CPUs to be competitive with GPUs. And with that, we still have the benefit of the large memory that goes along with CPUs. So, it's enough charts. Let's talk about what this looks like in action. Running through, we have our sparse quantized model versus an unoptimized model. As we can see, significantly faster, and it's already created its first paragraph, while the unoptimized model is struggling to do its first sentence. This is all towards the same quality uh, for our input prompt, where we, create, where we ask it to create a story about sparse neurons. So, coming back and looking at our key takeaways. First, for local inference, we're able to improve performance by up to 4x over the top of the current standard on CPUs. Additionally, when we scale this out into a server scenario, we're able to further increase that performance up to 7x. On, and this is specifically looking at how many inference streams we can do concurrently at the same performance level. And finally, we're able to use Cerebrus to train 2x faster on their platform to create these sparse models. So, help. Now, looking at next steps. As I said, all of these models are immediately available. We have them available on Hugging Face. You can download them, play with them yourselves. Additionally, we have our docs page available, which will walk through guides, tutorials, things like that on how to get started with these models. And finally, you can dive into Cerebrus's results on sparse training in their blog. Stay tuned, though, for additional, um, additional action items that are coming out of us. We will continue our research collaboration with Cerebrus. Ultimately, our goal is to wrap all of these results that we just walked through and more, the research behind it, into a paper we'll be pushing up on Archive. And in addition, expanding past what we have available right now by increasing our model sizes, increasing sparsity through continued algorithmic uh, advancements, combining it with better quantization techniques or lower quantization techniques such as N4, and ultimately putting everything together into parameter-efficient fine-tuning such as QLORA. 
So thank you, everyone. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, feel free to follow us on X, on LinkedIn, or join our Slack community. Thanks again. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, this is really, really exciting work. We are so proud of this work, not just because we think it will change the way people think about sparse models and especially inference, but because it's a perfect example of the unique capabilities of our product and our hardware to drive better ML. And so to that end, I'd like to next introduce you to Jessica, who's going to tell us about the new models, the new ML, and our product roadmap. Hi, everyone. Today, I want to talk to you about why Cerebris is the best platform for getting you to state-of-the-art Gen AI results. And this all comes back to Cerebris's ease of scaling, which is key not only for running these large models, but also for getting to the best model quality. Now, let's talk about why that is. Well, when you're running these large models, you're often hoping that what you're going to see is a nice, smooth loss curve telling you that your model is converging to the published results. But in reality, what you'll probably run into first are out-of-memory issues, model divergence problems, and even once you get it going, you may never converge to the state-of-the-art accuracy. And that's just the nature of these large Gen AI models. They're inherently complicated to work with. Beyond just the distribution problem to get the model running, it takes quite a lot of work and dealing with a lot of ML complexity to make sure these runs are good. These large models have so many parameters that they're often extremely sensitive to the exact way in which they've been tuned. And so what that means is that if you have a data problem or a precision problem or your learning rate schedule isn't tuned quite right, these can all cause small numerical issues that at this scale can accumulate and make your model explode. This means that it's often really hard for you to get to really high model quality for your own data just by using published hyperparameters out of the box. And this wouldn't be such a big deal, this iteration and learning and experimenting, except these runs are also extremely expensive. Large model runs can cost hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars, and so there's quite a lot of time and cost writing on getting this big run right. Now, obviously, we still have lots of amazing models out there, so what are people doing about this? And the ML experts, how they address this is by first designing and running lots of experiments on smaller models first. They'll then pick the winning hyperparameters that get the small model to good accuracy. And then they'll scale this up to a larger model and refine this tuning for large model dynamics. They'll iterate on this loop, learning as they go, until they get to a confident configuration for the biggest model. And the way to think about this process is that you never want to be spending a 30 billion parameter run for insights that you could have learned at 1 billion or 7 billion parameters. And so, as you test on larger and larger models, you get higher and higher confidence that your configuration is good for the largest model. But on GPUs, this process that's supposed to save you work actually is itself a lot of work. On GPUs, each time you move to a larger model, you have to refactor your code and deal with increasingly complicated parallelism in order to get it to work on a larger cluster. Even if you use a state-of-the-art distribution framework like Megatron, you are still responsible for managing the distribution strategy. You're responsible for configuring tensor parallelism, pipeline parallelism, expert parallelism, sequence parallelism. You're responsible for setting up interleaved pipelining schedules and for figuring out when to evict and recompute activations to further save on memory. You need to learn how to use 20,000 lines of code. And there's some C++ in there. There's some CUDA in there. 
And every single time you want to run a scaling experiment or even just tune your model architecture, you have to reconfigure this setup and debug your code again. Now look, these frameworks are amazing. They've been written by crack engineers. And you could absolutely learn how to do all these different types of parallelism or hire yourself a team to deal with these distribution problems. Or you could just not have distribution problems. With Cerebrus, all of this goes away. On Cerebrus, if you're trying to run a 175 billion parameter GPT model, it's only 565 lines of PyTorch code. And that's it. No CUDA, thank you. <laughs> on Cerebrus, as you're scaling from a 1 billion parameter model on the left to the 70 billion parameter model on the right, all you are changing is the size of your layers, the number of layers, and the number of heads. And because you never have to change your underlying model code, you can actually configure all of this just from a config file. And when you start to need more compute, because you've made your model 70 times larger, all you need to do to scale to a larger cluster is change a single number in your run command. And more Cerebrus nodes will automatically hop online, and you can continue to use your now larger Cerebrus cluster, still as if it's just a single device. So not only can you do your big run with no effort, but you can also do all of your small and medium and large scale experiments with no additional work. And that is the power of the Cerebrus platform. You can get to the highest quality model configurations without doing any additional work. So to think about it, on GPUs, small models are the default. So large models take increasingly more engineering effort. On Cerebrus, large models are the default. So small models are free. It's like pressing the easy button on large gen AI. But now let's talk about what people have actually done on Cerebrus and share some model results. First, an example from the medical domain, the Med42 model. With M42, a global healthcare company with over 450 hospitals and clinics around the world, we fine tuned Llama 70B on a curated healthcare data set and passed the US medical license exam in under a single week. This model beat GPT 3.5, which is much larger in scale, and the big run itself was done in less than a weekend. Now here's an example from the multilingual domain. With our customer, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, we developed Floor, a multilingual model that was state-of-the-art in Catalan. And because experimentation was so easy, the team was able to apply all of the latest language adaptation techniques to improve transfer learning for low resource languages. BSC is now using this model to develop specialized RAG systems in specific domains like the legal domain. And this run also only took a couple of days. Finally, late last year, with our strategic partner, Core42, we developed JS, a 30 billion parameter bilingual by the foundation model, completely pre-trained from scratch. And JS is not only state-of-the-art in Arabic, but it is also extremely competitive with similar size models in English. Now the challenge with JS was that there was a lack of high quality Arabic language training data. And on top of that, to make it harder, most of the tokenizers of today have been trained on English corpora and so don't extend very well to Arabic. So in order to get to a high quality model with the least amount of time and cost, which we're always trying to do, our team used the exact same iteration loop that we just talked about previously. To develop our own multilingual data set, we started with experiments at the 500 million parameter scale. And we ran many different experiments to test for the exact right ratio of Arabic, English, and code data to make sure that we had the best downstream Arabic language performance. We then selectively ran runs at the 1 billion, 3 billion, and 7 billion parameter scales so that we could get to really high confidence that this mix was the right one for our 13 billion and 30 billion parameter models. 
We then developed a new vocabulary optimized for cross-lingual alignment and trained a custom Arabic tokenizer to go along with it. Then with all these pieces in hand, we ran extensive hyperparameter sweeps at every model scale. And this really helped us to ensure the final model accuracy. And please don't just take it from me. Neha Sengupta, principal scientist on this project, shared that it was really easy for the Core 42 team to experiment at every model size and scale on the Cerebrus clusters, which they needed to do to get to the best results. They shared that there was no difference between running a job on a single system versus on multiple systems. Now, JS has actually been continuing to train on more data these last few months, and I'm excited to share that it's recently broken its own record and set a new high point in Arabic language model performance. JS has now been trained on 1.3 trillion tokens, and it's also available for you to access today in Core 42's Hugging Face repo. But though all this language work is super exciting, the space is moving extremely quickly, and now the frontier is in multimodality. And there's been so much energy around this space. There have been new ideas and models coming out every single week. And in the true spirit of the AI community, a lot of it has been open source, so you can try the ideas out yourselves. Except that each of these ideas is in its own separate GitHub repo. It has its own way of setting up how you might train and use using a different data set. It has a different way of running evals. And so if what you want to do is get started and mix and match these different ideas, it's actually still quite a bit of overhead. And so what I'm extremely proud to share is that we've made multimodality extremely easy on the Cerebrus platform. We've developed a plug-and-play framework that means that you can easily experiment with multiple different image encoders like CLIP or SIGLIF. You can experiment with multiple different LLM backbones like Mistral or Llama. We support generalized development of visual Q&A models so with very little time, you can get set up with either one of the latest configurations from the literature, like Lava or Animal or Eyes Wide Shut, or you can develop your own. So I want to show you a model we just put together in the last couple of days. And what you can see here is that our model is able to identify what each of these coins in the image is. And it's also able to tell how much each coin is worth. Now, this is not just text-based reasoning. It's also visual semantic reasoning. And it's able to combine this information to answer these questions, even though not all of that information was in the original image. But let's give it a slightly trickier example. And you can see here that not only is our model able to identify that this is a towel folded in the shape of an elephant, but it also had no trouble seeing through the elephant's disguise. With our flexible framework, we've trained multiple different model configurations just in the last few weeks, easily reproducing recent state-of-the-art works from literature. You can see here how our runs represented in the orange bars closely match the original versions of the Lava 1.5 and the SGPT-4V models. And we didn't just match these results, we improved on them. Because it's so easy to do large model experimentation on our platform, our team tried a few different training recipe runs, and they were able to build a 7 billion parameter version of the model that is competitive with the 13 billion parameter Lava 1.5 HD, a model that is twice the size and trained on 1.7 times larger resolution image data. And you can do this too. Oh, thanks. And the best part is that you can do this too. Our platform makes it so easy and simple to experiment that you can get the same results on your own data. And we've made it really easy to get started with our Cerebrus Model Zoo. In the Model Zoo, we've included multiple different sample model configurations already set up to make it easy for you to configure all of these different settings. We've included multiple training recipes we've already tried. We've included data sets that have already been pre-processed for you to use. And if you have your own data, 
we're also going to be sharing our data pre-processing tools that have already been configured to make sure you get really high throughput training. Now, everything in the Model Zoo is usable across hardware platforms. You can use it on CPU and GPU up to a certain model size. But then, of course, because Cerebrus has a lot of memory, on the Cerebrus platform, you can also try multiple different scales of language models. You can try longer context lengths, larger image resolutions, and you can just really go to town and see what you can do. All the model checkpoints are also available on Hugging Face. The 7 billion parameter model and 13 billion parameter model we just talked about are already there, and we'll be releasing a 70 billion parameter variant by the end of this month. And I'm just really excited to be sharing all of this with you because at Cerebris, our mission is to bring state-of-the-art Gen AI to everyone. You should also have a state-of-the-art Gen AI model for your use case. It is accessible. And at Cerebris, we've built solutions at every layer to help you get there. We have the huge flexible compute, simple secure cloud access, and we have AI services to help take you all the way to the high quality model result. So let's talk about solutions. First, if you have your own data and you have a use case in mind, and you just want to get to a high quality model on a time and dollar budget, we can help with that. Through our Cerebrus AI model services, our ML experts will work with your team to help you build a Gen AI model. And we can do it either for you or with you. We'll help you build your vocabulary and your data set. We'll run all of the experiments to make sure you get to that optimal configuration. And we'll help handle all of the training, the fine tuning, the downstream evaluation runs. We can do RAG systems if that's what you're interested in. We can make sure that we perform alignment for your use case. And then finally, we'll deliver to your team the final trained model weights with everything that you need to get it deployed. And of course, we'll teach your team how to do it too. Our ML team has produced multiple state-of-the-art models from multilingual LLMs to healthcare chatbots to code models. And we can help you with all of the latest ML techniques so you can be confident in a high quality end result for your data and use case. And of course, whatever you build, it belongs to you. Now, if you don't need solutions and you just want the best compute for high quality Gen AI, our Cerebra supercomputers are also available both on-prem and in the cloud. And we're excited to work with your organization in any capacity that you might need and are looking forward to helping your teams also get to state-of-the-art Gen AI for your use cases. So, thank you. And with that, I'll pass it off to our SVP of Product and Strategy, Andy Hawk, who will be bringing on board some of our customers and partners who can share firsthand about their experiences with Cerebris. Thanks. Good job. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Andy Hawk. I'm the Senior Vice President of Product and Strategy at Cerebrus. I got to say, one of the coolest things about working at Cerebrus is that we often get to work with customers that aren't just making incremental advances in artificial intelligence. These are folks that are really pushing the boundaries of scale, accuracy, and domain in a way that isn't well supported by traditional infrastructure. Right, so what you heard about already today from Jessica and Sean and Andrew is a lot about our technology. And we're gonna shift gears a little bit now to talk about value and impact. And what better way to do that than having us talk less and having our customers talk a little bit more. So to kick things off, I'm gonna start with a video uh, that has some testimonial from some of our earliest customers who are really pushing the boundaries of scale with AI's uh, supercomputers for science. The idea of a vapor scale engine is completely novel to us. I didn't think I would see a chip this size in my lifetime. 
What Cerebrus gives us specifically is this one chip that is easily programmable that we can take and run our applications in parallel. So that allows us to think about algorithms and applications in completely new directions that we didn't think about previously. The challenge that we face in the current supercomputers is the utilization that we get is very low because of the sparsity, because of limitations in reading and writing to memory. On Cerebrus, we can map that entire application very well onto the wafer scale engine. So we have had a, this advanced memory technologies program, which is a collaboration with Cerebrus and NNSA Labs for the past two years. The focus is uh, to build the next generation of wafer scale engines. In Sandia, we focus on problems that are important for national security, as we are interested in a particular problem that we want to solve, and we want to solve it as fast as we can. What the wafer scale engine gives us is an opportunity to solve that problem. If you can fit that problem in the wafer scale engine, you can solve it really, really fast with the 900,000 cores that you have available. We are also very excited by AIML workloads, especially uh, two kinds. One is AI for science workloads, transformer models for scientific simulations, and how to map them to the Cerebrus hardware. Number two, to build foundation models that are custom to DOE use cases our foundation models for science and how to build those models using Cerebrus hardware, not just one uh, vapor scale engine, but a huge cluster of vapor scale engines. The collaboration with Cerebrus enables us to solve those problems really quickly. So how we envision a world where there's gonna be massive need for both AI training and inference is what we're really interested in. And of course, we're focused on applying that in science, so we're interested in how we build these systems that would couple to say, existing simulation-oriented platforms or automated laboratories. But at the heart of it is scalable AI and both scalable hardware, scalable algorithms, scalable uh, methodologies and workflows. And I think uh, our partnership with Cerebrus will allow us to really explore that in an unprecedented way. One way we can view platforms like the Cerebrus system is a time machine for doing AI research. When we're doing research and development, what's really important is that we can test an idea very quickly and get a uh, notion of whether the direction that we're heading is going to be fruitful or not. And that's probably one of our use cases of the CS systems, uh, the most important one, because it allows us to try more ideas quicker than we could if we're just using the regular platforms. And uh, that's a big, uh, big accelerator for us. All right. Thank you to Siva and Rick there from Sandia National Laboratory and Argonne National Laboratory. I love that idea of building and implementing algorithms that are too large or have too much sparsity to fit on traditional infrastructure and then delivering performance that is like a time machine to accelerate your team to the point where they have a model that works for their purpose. So, in the world of remote work, we've decided to up our game and bring real customers, partners, and developers onto the stage as well. So I'd like to invite out my esteemed panel to join me on stage. Come on out, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So like I said at the beginning, we have, uh, we, we have good friends across industries around the world that are pushing the boundaries of what's possible with AI, with Cerebrus. Um, so today, joining me on stage is Jim Culver from GlaxoSmithKline, Tim Bishop, and Pranitha Elegunti from the Mayo Clinic, and then Professor Irina Risch from the University of Montreal and Mila. And Rather than having me read out the very impressive bios, I thought I would begin by inviting each of our panelists to say a little bit about yourselves, your role, and, and actually importantly for this audience, um, what your teams are doing at the forefront of large-scale AI and Gen AI for your work. So we'll kick things off with you, Jim. Yeah, thank you. You got it. Thank you so much for having me. Um, nice to see you all. Uh, yeah, so my name is Jim Culver, and I'm a director of AI products at uh, GSK. 
And GSK has been working with Cerebra since 2019. Um, and uh, one part of, one, I guess, part of the uh, strategy of GSK has been to really invest in artificial intelligence and machine learning to really accelerate drug discovery and uh, drug development. And so thinking about how we can use that in conjunction with some of our other strategic priorities, uh, such as functional genomics and other, other methods to really uh, gather large amounts of data to really start to build these, these models to really move drug discovery forward. It's, it's really an incredible mission where development velocity matters to bring new therapies to market sooner. Awesome to have you. Thank you. Uh, it's a very natural lead-in to healthcare and life sciences with our friends from the Mayo Clinic. So, Tim, want to kick us off? Hi, my name is Tim Bishop. I'm a lead software engineer in the generative AI program at Mayo Clinic. Um, and we've been working with Cerebris since uh, just January, so relatively new. We kicked off our generative AI program uh, just last year, uh, 2023. So we are trying to figure out how we can use generative AI um, to advance healthcare. And we've got a couple of projects uh, going with Cerebris to build foundational models um, where we leverage uh, the power of Mayo's massive uh, data sets um, and marry that with the uh, AI expertise and compute that Cerebris uh, brings to the table to help us bring solutions uh, to get better care for people and advance cures. Nice. Pranitha? Hi, I'm Pranitha Luganti. I'm an operations administrator with the Mayo Clinic. And as my colleague Tim shared, we are very excited to be here as we start our generative AI journey. Um, Mayo Clinic has been and is ranked the number one healthcare provider, not only in the nation, but also internationally by uh, US News and World Report and Newsweek. Just last year alone, our staff of about 80,000 provided care for 1.3 million patients from all 50 United States and 130 countries uh, globally. About four years ago, we started a strategic vision, as Tim alluded, um, of not only advancing cures through discovery and delivery, but also to deliberately connect patients with data and provide scalable solutions and to transform healthcare. And this is where we're really excited because fundamental to transforming that healthcare is AI. And we strongly believe that it's a Promethean moment in healthcare to leverage not only our data assets, but also to leverage large language models and generative AI. Man, I, I love that Promethean moment. Um, and I can, I can imagine in our audience, right, we can imagine a future where AI can not only inform care, but also be used to inform patients. It's such a powerful potential. So at the, at the foundation of all that, of course, there's a lot of fundamental research into ML methods, mathematics, algorithms. Uh, and we also have today with us Professor, Professor Irina Risch from University of Montreal. Over to you. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's of course. lots of fun. Uh, love to come back to California every time from Montreal. Uh, <laughs> I wonder why. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm Irina, Irina Risch, I'm professor um, at Computer Science Department of University of Montreal, and uh, also a core faculty at Miller, uh, which is Quebec AI Institute, led by Yosho Benjia. You might know that place. I guess it's the largest uh, deep learning research lab in the world. Uh, I lead <coughs> a so-called Canada Excellence Research Chair. It's like a large uh, seven-year grant, and I have like group with 45 plus people, all working on uh, advancing AI towards more broad, general, and autonomous. Uh, and we don't shy away from putting AGI as a goal of the lab, eventually. Uh, most recently, we're working on um, the hot topics of neural scaling laws, uh, large systems, basically foundation models, uh, language models, multimodal models, time series foundation models. We're training them on supercomputers such as uh, Frontier and Summit, and hopefully also on Argon Lab stuff, just like Rick Stevens was saying. Um, and uh, we also try to apply that to healthcare, to neuroscience, to computational psychiatry. Uh, so in a sense, I think we all have the common theme of applying AI, and particularly large-scale AI, 
to healthcare, neuroscience, and the kind of mental health and health in general. It, if only we had more time machines to build all that quickly. Awesome, thank you, Irina. So um, the, the second part of the panel, I wanted to engage our friends in a conversation, quite honestly, about why Cerebris? Right? There's a lot of choices for infrastructure and, um, and ML services out there. Um, so why would people that are really at the cutting edge choose, uh, choose Cerebris to work with and get their perspective on that here for you? Um, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna stick with our order here because it's convenient on stage. But Jim, um, as you mentioned, GSK was one of the earliest users of Cerebrus. I I remember deploying uh, Gen One systems. Right, this was before Gen Three, so Gen One systems, um, and your teams uh, beginning work even then on large transformers for genomics and epigenomic data and and building new models that hadn't been built before. Um, but your work is really transformed and evolved in scale since then. So I wonder if you could share some of the lessons and what that journey has been like. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so I think some of the early work that we did together, as you mentioned, was focused on some of our sequence learning products that we've been building. Um, really focused on using DNA and RNA sequences uh, and training models on that, uh, as well as epigenomics data. Uh, for applications like predicting splice, uh, splicing patterns, yeah. also uh, doing things like predicting directionality for genetic variants. Um, and I guess there were a few things that stood out from that work together. Uh, first of all, uh, Cerebris has been fantastic partners. Um, I think in terms of just the capabilities, in terms of sheer compute, there weren't a lot of options to build the kinds of models that we wanted to build. And so uh, that first and foremost, and, and was really successful. Um, I think also just the iteration speed that we were able to work together to really uh, take an agile process and go out there and build something, test it, learn from it, and then kind of repeat that cycle, that uh, design, build, test cycle, which I think is so critical for, for product development. Um, and I guess the third thing was also just the, the expertise uh, of Cerebris, and so we were really able to, to work together as partners to uh, design and iterate and get to a solution more quickly. Um, and yeah, and, and I think our work has evolved since then. Now we're focused on building you know, bigger models, generative AI models, uh, it, for example, uh, trying to build large language models focused on scientific compute to help us build AI assistance to help our scientists do their work faster, so. Right, Yeah. for, for those of you that like me, maybe recovering researchers, you remember those vast treasure troves of information and journal articles that you will surely never read. And so, yeah, the, these kinds of models have extraordinary power. And thank you. It means a lot coming from you guys. This, the, the GSK AI team are amongst the black belts of enterprise AI in, in pharma. Um, and so it's been an, just an awesome pleasure to, to work with your team. Um, so, we were back in the back when Jessica was actually talking about that approach to iterative model development, and that leads me in maybe to a, a question for our friends at Mayo, um, which is, you know, Tim, as you mentioned, our engagement with Mayo is relatively fresh, um, but you and your team have extraordinary data assets, um, but that also have data privacy concerns, right? So your teams are, are building fundamentally new models on fundamentally, data set, fundamentally new data sets that require uh, sensitive data handling, data privacy, as well as this partnership that we've talked about between ML researchers and, uh, and, and domain experts. So wondering if you can share a little bit about what you guys are doing with us and, uh, and, and, and what you've observed so far. Sure. Um, one of the reasons we went with Cerebris is it's tough to find these skills in the marketplace to build these large language models. And um, compute can be expensive. So we wanted uh, to partner with somebody that would be able to help us uh, find the recipe for the model we wanted to build. And um, so you can think of it as not like you just have all of your data and you're gonna go throw it into a model and see, see what happens. No, uh, when we're working with Cerebris, they're evaluating each of our data sets, trying to figure out oh, what's the relative value of this for our end goal. Um, and you can imagine, uh, as Andy mentioned, that working with healthcare data is difficult, um, especially when you're talking about patient data. 
And you may think, oh, you de-identify it, you can do whatever you want. That's not the case. Uh, healthcare data is highly regulated. Um, there are big penalties for not doing the right things with it. You have to have secure environments in order to process it. Um, and Cerebrus has been very flexible uh, working with us uh, in, in that regard, getting those systems set up so we can, we can do this work. There's a lot of work that has to happen, uh, setting up systems, getting approvals, uh, that sort of thing, before you can even start building the model. Um, we, we had a lot of learning to do, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, um, and I, I think one of the other uh, big factors is that uh, the model that we build with Cerebrus when we're done is ours. Uh, a lot of people want Mayo's data, or they want, you know, if we build a model, they want a piece of that model. And that brings up a lot of questions in terms of, oh, is that, can we allow our patient data to be used in that way? What are the implications now that this model is um, not within our control? There's a lot of questions that have to be answered in terms of, well, can you prevent uh, any sort of data from being able to be uh, retrieved using like jailbreaking? Uh, what kind of guardrails do you have to have uh, in place to do that? All those questions would need to be answered before we even started. And where we're at now is we need to get started so we can answer those questions. Yeah. Um, so, yep, yeah, they've been great to work with. It's very clear that they know what they're doing. Um, and yeah, great experience so far. Thank you. And it's, it, it's been awesome to start work with you guys as well. Like I said, we, um, at Cerebris, we are a team of unafraid engineers uh, and scientists, and we love big, ambitious projects that push the boundaries of what's possible. And I, I think Andrew, our CEO, often says, you know, we're, we're fundamentally tool builders, right? We're building a platform to allow our partners and customers like this to ask and answer more questions at larger scale than would be possible on traditional infrastructure. Um, but as we've discussed, it's not just, you know, deliver a system to a loading dock and then walk away. Um, there's often a, a deep partnership involved. And Pranitha, I was wondering if you could share a little bit about the, the partnership that, that we've built and how it operates. Yeah, no, I think it's been a great experience, as, as Tim shared. So we've uh, engaged in a multi-year strategic collaborative partnership with Cerebris, and quite honestly, it's a natural fit. Um, both of our organizations are deeply committed to innovation, um, it's part of our DNA. It's, you know, they are very customer centric and our organization is very patient centric. And what's been really um, wonderful to see through uh, our partnership for, as we build our first LLM, is just how nuanced the team is in truly understanding the data, the challenges, and what we hope to uh, arrive um, at the end, uh, as our end goal, which is to provide better cures for our patients globally. Um, and the team's done a great job. We're working on our first model focused on utilizing genetic data, which is very difficult if anyone is aware of um, genetic data, but leveraging genetic data for rheumatoid arthritis patients, which roughly impacts 18 million patients worldwide, and being able to predict their response to um, all of our uh, care um, processes as appropriate. So. It's, um, there's just so many fun problems. In fact, one of the, I think one of the interesting and fun challenges is figuring out what to attack first, yeah. right? And it boils down to, to business value and impact and do we have the right data and, and can we build a, a model that does that? Um, and it's just been such an, an exciting journey to, to, to get started uh, with you and the team. Um, so as we, as we wrap up, I wanted to actually bring things back to, uh, to Irina to talk a little bit. Um, you know, we've, we've hinted at both through the preceding talks and our discussion about sort of what it takes to build a model. Um, and Irina, I think you and the, the institute and university students probably know better than most what's involved in actually bringing a large model to life or distributing one of these large workloads on, on traditional systems. And, What's that journey like, and, uh, and, and how can Cerebris help researchers do it better? Yeah, it's, a, it's indeed a good question, because uh, last year was very interesting. As I mentioned, we uh, obtained large grant uh, on Summit Supercomputer at Oak Ridge Lab, and later on, on Frontier. 
and we decided to kind of follow in footsteps like open source AI and try to also build large scale language models. So we teamed up with uh, Together and Stanford Research for Foundation uh, Center for Research for Foundation Models. So we built uh, jointly Red Pajama Insight model, and then later that year we built like four 10 billion language models. We built the uh, uh, multilingual models, like the first Hindi model in October. Actually, we built multimodal models like this Robin Suite or like whatever vision language model so on. But it was quite a journey because actually uh, we learned that things are not so easy as they may seem. And especially like machine learning students are not necessarily uh, HPC experts. So we did have some on the team, but like not everyone. And we learned like basically on our own mistakes that for example, you take PTM models that are out there, they're open sourced, they have certain architecture, but they optimized for being uh, model parallel and being trained in model parallel way on clusters with say eight GPUs per node. Um, Frontier has similar architecture too, but not Summit. And Summit has six GPUs per node, plus those GPUs are the hundreds and not the hundreds. Plus interconnect is uh, not as fast as uh, in maybe usually hundred clusters. So you end up with um, figuring out that just taking model will not work. You have to refactor model, so it will be like divisible by six, so you can scale it uh, properly and really use model parallelism efficiently, or you will waste a lot of compute. So we kind of learned the hard way that things are much trickier than they may seem when people say, we just use large compute and build foundation model. And then, Actually, there are many more stories about just like switching from one architecture to another uh, can be a problem that you may set like, okay, now we have all this compute, let's build chinchilla model 70 billion. Oops, you do scalability studies and you realize that on this hardware with this amount of memory on the hundreds and with this interconnect speed, you cannot really scale efficiently above maybe 20 billion, stuff like that. So it's been a lot of, um, um, useful experience, I would say, but uh, I would rather prefer to avoid it next time. So apparently with Cerebrus, we may not have such problems and that sounds very promising. So it's yes. one answer why Cerebrus, but it's kind of not all because collaboration, it's not just about using compute, which is amazing thing on its own, but Cerebrus also has amazing researchers. And our team, and actually I historically, I was always very interested in sparsity. I actually wrote a book about sparse modeling 10 years ago. And that topic is essential to many applications because things in this world are very structured and you need to exploit the structure. So Cerebrus does a lot of research on that and has papers about that. Scaling, scaling laws, it's also my passion and it's more like a theoretical side and also like Joel Hessness and others have amazing papers on this topic. So it's compute and science. That's why Cerebrus. Thank you. Um, so I, I think as, as we wrap things up, Irina, I was reflecting during your remarks about these back to the drawing board moments, right? Uh, on traditional systems where you start to distribute a model as you scale up the model or scale out your cluster. And on a traditional system, you're often back to the drawing board, which is great if, uh, you, you, what you're trying to do is extend PhD theses, right? Um, but if what you're trying to do is, is build a model more quickly, establish a set of scaling laws quantitatively by scaling up quickly, then the ability to do that very quickly really matters. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank our panel. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. We're really excited to continue this awesome work together. So thank you very much. Thanks for inviting us. And with that, um, as we head off the stage, we are going to go into our next session. So folks, we'll come over here. And then um, next up, I'll be inviting back out Cerebra CEO, Andrew Feldman, to have a fireside chat. Um, thank you.
Well, greetings, everybody. It's my, my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce my friend, Rashid Attar. Rashid is VP of Cloud Computing at Qualcomm. And uh, <laughs> you get to some level in your career and you can't talk without PowerPoint. <laughs> and, and, and so we will have a slide or two as well. Um, we've been working together now for, for months. Uh, we announced our partnership uh, last week. And I'm honored to have Rashid uh, with us to share a little bit about their view and what they're working on. Just Rashid, welcome first. And wh why don't you tell everybody just a tiny little backswing. My guess is everybody here knows a little bit about Qualcomm, but why don't you share just a little bit. Firstly, Andrew, thanks for inviting, inviting me, inviting uh, Qualcomm to the event. Um, happy to be here. Um, at Qualcomm, we started our AI journey maybe a little over 15 years ago, 2007, 2008. Uh, didn't even call it quite AI at the time. Um, we started then. Um, it's been several years of innovation, focus on strictly on inference that led to lots of implementations of these technologies into our devices all the way from smartphones to laptops to cars. And over the last few years, it's been you know, taking all of those same technologies, same core assets, adapting them for cloud. Um, and then over the last, uh, late last year, we announced our first deployment uh, in a public cloud at Amazon EC2. And since then, additional cloud and, and so on. And, uh, at this point in time, you'll find Qualcomm AI, both hardware and software, probably in billions of devices at any given point in time. You get to use big numbers in the consumer side, don't you? Uh, billions, of, billions of devices, that sounds nice. Uh, um, you know, when, when I think of Qualcomm, we usually think of, of edge devices. Right, and, and your, your Ultra 100 and your AI 100 are, are data center d d devices. Um, tell us a little bit about the, the, the tensions or, or why you guys pushed from the, from the edge to, to, to the data center. So as we looked at, you know, we, we got very good at doing AI inference at the edge. As we looked at where AI was going, where inference was scaling in, I think this is really bright. <laughs> <laughs> That's white. <laughs> so as we saw uh, where inference was going, uh, there was clearly the edge component, which we've been working on, but there was also a clear need for very high performance per watt, uh, price performance solutions in the cloud. And there was various sets of applications where you had things being done at the edge, but then you wanted digital twins in the cloud uh, that has naturally led to these technologies, obviously adapted for the cloud, being uh, deployed in the cloud and, and being done at a larger, at a different scale. You know, when I looked at your, your Ultra 100, one of the things that struck me was that it, it, it feels like it has a tradition of, of, of low power compute, right? I mean, it, it feels like some of the, uh, some of the thinking that, that is necessary in consumer devices where they're running on batteries or they're running where power is everything has been brought because it's, it's such a power efficient uh, inference engine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the AI100 Ultra, it's based on a lot of the core technologies we developed for mobile, obviously adapted for cloud, but it has in terms of even the way we get more memory bandwidth, it's by adding and, and we're using low power memory. So it's all built on LPDDR, which is denser. Uh, you know, this single device has 128 gig of uh, on-card storage, which is, for its class of products, quite compelling. And that thinking, that uh, focus on price performance, uh, re you know, supporting a breadth of models, right? It's not, this particular product was designed for LLMs, but it does really good for computer vision, natural language processing, which is largely embedding models in the context of LLMs uh, as well. So yes, that, that theme, that focus on low power, price performance, dense compute, 
has followed us through uh, on these class of products as well. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about maybe we can share some thoughts uh, on the rise of inference as a workload. And tell us about your thoughts. So I think we were one of the few or early companies who noticed the need for AI inference on a handheld device. That's where the early research started. And I think we, we brought this to handheld devices in the 2015, 16 uh, timeframe. That was, I think, our first generation products. And more and more has been built up over there. But as we observed the market a few years later, as we started developing products for targeted towards cloud, we realized that you know, you're going to train a lot of models, and the models will be big. But at the end of the day, when you're done, you're, there's a lot to infer with. So you may train the model once, but you're probably going to run inference you know, billions of times, hundreds of billions of times. So there, the price uh, performance, the, the cost aspect would become key. The easy to access, easy to make work, run with just about any form factor servers, or, or just, you know, build a card that will plug into just about any server and just work, would become quite critical. And that's proving out now. So if you notice some of the announcements from some of the biggest players in the industry, they're noticing inferences now starting to get to at least on par and you know, over time exceed uh, training. And that's where you know, there, there's a massive demand uh, not everyone can afford it at the prices it's at today. If you buy a product for training and try and reuse it for inference, uh, that's where products of this class become critical. And pushing the boundaries on performance with these products is even more important just because of the, the demand and the cost without it. Yeah, that, that was an area where, where we found a very uh, a sort of kindred spirit with, with Qualcomm, right? The, uh, there are four compute steps in, in, in AI, right? There's um, sort of your data prep, very little compute. Training, huge amount of compute. One customer, one model, huge compute. There's once that's finished, the evaluation, very little compute. And then there's the inference. And the inference has different characteristics, right? It's modest compute, but it's a function of the number of users. So as the technology gets more successful, as you move from hundreds of thousands to millions or tens of millions of active users a day, the demand for inference goes up. And the demand for inference compute goes up. And, and that's um, a dynamic that interested us a great deal at, at Cerebrus, and a, a dynamic that we thought was important to get ahead of, because we, we know that if you don't drive down the cost of inference, all right, fewer people do inference. And then the impact of AI will be less in society. And so if you don't attack this uh, at, its, at its root to drive down this cost, and for those of us who, who spent, like I did, the first part of my career in networking, we, we know what happens when you make networking free. Right? I mean, that's, what ha that's why WhatsApp exists. That's why you have approximately 100% penetration in the world of, of WhatsApp, right? Four people all over the world have free communication. Change the world. And when you think about AI and you think about how do we drive down the cost of inference to the point where um, it's not a burden, where you know, Microsoft doesn't cap you, <laughs> right? Then you, you got to rip cost out of it. And that was really at the, at the essence of our partnership. We, we, we took a bunch of different tacks together. You want to talk a little bit about how, how we did that? <clears throat> Absolutely. So before we get into the specific techniques, you know, as we built our hardware and our software stack, the goal was always, you know, you can train, you can take a model that was trained anywhere, and in a few simple steps, we will allow or enable inference on our product. Having said that, those simple steps still take effort, and we were looking for, you know, the, the partnership makes sense where we have a partner where you can have a model that's pre-trained, but you can also train the model knowing our architecture. So hardware-aware training, think of network architecture search as one example, where you now optimize this. It's, the model is going to produce the same results, so the same quality results, but do so perhaps in a smaller size, perhaps faster. 
So that's one example. And as you go down, go down this list, we then looked at, okay, you can have a trained model. If you could run that same trained model, you had a sparse version of the model, and ideally you want unstructured sparsity so that the, you know, the folks doing the training are not constrained in how they're setting up the model. If we have a solution on the other side for inference that can handle a unstructured sparse model through largely software means where you know where the zeros are and then you, you know, adapt for that and you, when you read the weights back in, you decompress and you use them. So that's a way to get yet another technique in where the partnership on the training side helps. So you have a model which could have been produced as is, but you bring in sparsity and you know, we know how to handle sparsity on the other side. We have other new techniques, so if you, go, if you just look at this list, there's sparsity, which you know, Sean and others talked about earlier today. You can also have speculative decoding, so this is a very exciting technique where you have a target model, or in some cases, the teacher-student model, where the target model is the big one. You have a small model using the same tokenizer, which will run ahead and produce a bunch of results. Odds are it's right a good 70, 80% of the time, and with that you get additional speed up. Now in order to do this, you need a training solution that is going to produce a draft model along with the target model. Because without the draft model, you can't apply speculative decode. Now once you have that, you now want a, you know, on our side, on the inference side, we would handle uh, running both these models in, in a certain fashion to get you additional gain. Uh, and then, as you, if you look through this list, we, you know, Qualcomm was also one of the companies that, there were several others, uh, you know, Intel, Microsoft, AMD, um, uh, NVIDIA, that helped define a microscaling, uh, essentially a lesser bit floating point format, if you will. And uh, we are one of the first to support it. And you know, with that additional, uh, with, with that additional feature added. So as you go down this list, there's a bunch of these features. These are all state-of-the-art features today. We don't know what the research community will produce in the coming months, right. but through this partnership, we'll always be at the vanguard of adapting these, you know, understanding these techniques delivering trained models which take advantage of these techniques and having an inference solution uh, ready to run these models. And you know you can go from three steps to take a trained model to infer to no steps because when the model is released, it'll come with a fully optimized, ready to deploy, ready to infer model. You know, I, I, as I've thought about this partnership, um, it sounds obvious, right? That, that if you train a model knowing the hardware that, that is going to do the inference, you, you can make optimizations for it, right? And we, we've seen this again and again in our space over the years, that um, w w once you know the user, <laughs> right, uh, of the trained model, you, you can do all sorts of things that, that, that bring costs out and drive performance up. And, and that's really what, what we've done together we identified a series of techniques. Um, and these techniques were algorithmic. These techniques were compression. These techniques were searching for optimizations in the model architecture that could be advantaged by the underlying hardware. These are all cutting edge techniques and we can rip out 90% of the cost of, of doing inference. And together, I, I think that's an enormously powerful thing. And I, I think as we look forward, you're going to see more and more of this uh, across the industry. And I, I think it's not just the, 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 these, these are illustrative, right? It turns out that we're the best in the, the world at, at sparsity. Uh, it turns out that, that the Ultra 100 is very, very good sparse engine um, in inference, right? Right, so you, you, you get two and a half X performance gain. Um, but there are going to be new and other inventions over the, the months and years ahead, and each time we will be able to collaborate, stay on top, and, and drive uh, uh, 
drive cost out of the system. When you drive cost out of the system, what happens? More people use it. More people use it, the diffusion of AI and the benefits of AI spread. And th that's really sort of what is a passion for, uh, for Rashid and I is, is how, do we, how do we push AI into the community? And you got trained models, you, you got to infer uh, on models, you got to get good data sets, and people need to collaborate so that, so that we can rip this cost out. That's exactly right. You know, in this, <clears throat> just this example, we've got four techniques. Uh, not all are completely additive, but cumulatively we estimate you, we deliver about 10x improvement. And you can slice this in different ways. You could make a particular solution faster. You can enable multiple users with that additional throughput that you've achieved. And here's the interesting piece. As we push on these techniques, you know, all the way from cloud to other devices, you can see that because of these techniques, more and more can be done more broadly, not just in the cloud. And, and that's exciting because, you know, the ultimate future of AI is there's this range of uses. There'll be some in the cloud, there'll be some in the car, there'll be some on a laptop, and, and so on. I, yeah, and th th that's when those of us who, who live to train models see the impact of their models everywhere, right? In, in exactly that description is, you don't have to have your laptop, you don't have to have your phone. It, it, it is sort of embedded in the fabric of your life. And you can only do that when inference costs. Uh, get really, really low. With that, I want to thank Rashid. I want to thank you so much for uh, coming today. Let's give Rashid a round of uh, applause. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. All right. We have one more fireside chat, and that stands between you and, and, and a party. Uh, I, I think in free alcohol, I think is, uh, so we, we, we will, uh, we've saved the, the best for last. And with that, I think uh, we can invite uh, Kirill Evtimov to the, to the stage. Kirill? <laughs> All right. Um, A little bit about Carol. Uh, he's one of the few people I've ever met whose work ethic I admire. It's prodigious. And uh, while he lives in, in the United Arab Emirates, uh, he keeps both times. You can reach him. It, it, is, it is a truly prodigious thing that uh, I'm in awe of. And, and I, I think, uh, by way of more formal introduction, Carol is. Uh, uh, group CTO at G42, and uh, that's of the holding company and CEO of Core 42, the largest holding. And so I, I can keep going to make him uncomfortable if we, if you'd like. But th thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, and I appreciate the kind words. <laughs> Tell us a little um, bit about, about G42. It might not be a household name for everybody. Before I start, having two titles to your name is not always <laughs> as uh, nice it, as it may seem. But um, speaking seriously, I'm super excited um, and uh, energized by what we're doing at the group level and what we're doing within the individual operating companies that are part of G42. So G42 is a company based in Abu Dhabi, the capital of United Arab Emirates. The company was established in 2018 and G stands for group. We have several operating companies with a single objective, to deliver the full spectrum of capabilities required to build, deploy, and operate AI applications. If you look at the very left, we start with our physical infrastructure. We have a company that specializes in designing, building, and operating data centers. 
buildings where we host our digital infrastructure. The chips that you saw today go into those data centers that Hasna, which is the name of the company, is um, building and operating. The second entity is called Core 42. And Core 42 is really at the heart of what G42 does. We are the enabling tissue for the individual use cases, for the individual uh, companies within G42, as well as for our clients to use and deploy their AI applications. From there, we have a company that specializes in data and analytics. The company name is Preside. It's a publicly listed company on the Abu Dhabi Stock Exchange. And then we have several companies that specialize in specific domains. M42 is a company that specializes in healthcare, Bionat in geospatial, AIQ in energy. By the way, Bionat is the second uh, publicly listed company from uh, our portfolio, again, on the Abu Dhabi Stock Exchange. Um, G42 is really a national AI champion. And as such, we really work on one of the most complicated and difficult problems to solve. We typically work at a scale that is very difficult to match. And we implement both large-scale enterprise solutions as well as national-scale programs. And just to give you a flavor in terms of what those national-scale programs may look like, I'll give you a couple of examples. Our M42 company is running the Emirati Genome Program. This is a large-scale, national-scale program in order to understand the genome of the Emirati population with the objective to really improve the health and longevity of the population in the country. As part of this program, there have been 500,000 people whose DNA has been sequenced. We have a data for over 100 petabytes of sequenced genome. And by the way, people who participate in this program are participating on voluntary basis. There is no compensation for them to participate. So you can imagine how valuable this information is, especially if you pair it with uh, medical records that M42 is providing as a MRR, EMR provider in the country and with the insurance data, the claims data that um, the company is also um, running. So that's just one example. On the other spectrum, you have use cases where we build and support the emergency response systems. So as you can imagine, the, the variety of the use cases is what makes this job exciting and the hours don't matter. <laughs> um, the last piece that I want to mention here is really to give you a sense of how big we are and um, how diverse we are. The company today is over 20,000 professionals and we have people coming from 75 different nationalities uh, in, in, in the group. We have a very diverse set of researchers, engineers, entrepreneurs, program managers, all working on the same mission to advance AI. And just to give you a little bit more flavor why this is not new for us, the company built the supercomputer in 2019 called Artemis. It was the first supercomputer that was built and deployed in the Middle East. It was at the time of launch the 26th largest HPC on the list of uh, 500 uh, largest supercomputers. Today, four years later, that computer is still on the list. It's at number 107. 
And lastly, if you're curious, and probably most of you already have figured out why 42, but for those that are still not sure, we're paying homage, we're paying homage <laughs> to a person called Douglas Adams, who wrote the book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This amazing book where um, we have a giant supercomputer whose sole job was to answer the question of the universe, the life, and everything. And after a quadrillion years of compute, the answer was 42. So we thought that it would be a good idea for us to pay homage to this brilliant man, brilliant writer, and that's why we are G42. I, I thought for sure the meaning of the universe would be a prime number. I mean, I was just, <laughs> that's just my thought, but I... <laughs> and by the way, in binary, it's one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Um, why don't you share a little bit about our partnership and how we've been working together over the last 15 months? We've been very fortunate and honored to be able to build several extremely meaningful and valuable partnerships with leading technology companies around the world. From Microsoft to OpenAI to Vast to Qualcomm, but at the same time, the work that we're doing with Cerebris is just a true enabler for us to innovate at a pace that we have ambition. So during the talk earlier, you probably saw several models that were trained, several models that were released and used in production today, starting with Jays, going through MET42, through Floor. So how is it possible that in a, such a short period of time since we launched the first cluster, which was I think in June of last year? We, we announced it in June. How is it possible that we were able to deliver so many different models and models that are really world-leading models in the space of bilingual large language models, in the space of um, specialized models for healthcare? Um, how is it possible? So it's really around us being able to iterate at a scale that wasn't possible before. And we're very proud by the work that we're doing with Andrew's team. Um, it spans across not only building supercomputers, it spans across us working on improving the software layer for the system, as well as working on machine learning um, um, activities that are absolutely required in order for us to move with the speed that we're moving with. I, I think international partnerships are no joke. They're, they're not easy, um, uh, especially not with partners that are exactly 12 hours ahead. Um, right, that's, you couldn't ask for a worse time difference. Um, we, we have calls with uh, Carol's team every day in collaboration uh, on the, on the model building and with our researchers, uh, we, we talk, uh, are engaged constantly. Um, I have made horrendous gaffes uh, and they've sort of forgiven me for, for not knowing uh, cultural norms. Um, but I, I think we are deep down and the reason for, for me anyway it's been a success is that we're sort of kindred spirits. We are. Uh, committed to watching, to building the AI that has an impact on the world. And um, when you have people who you are partnering with, who, who are similarly sort of driven, the, uh, what, you guys, what we can do together is extraordinary. And as I spoke about earlier, we've together stood up eight exaflops, four in Santa Clara, four in uh, Stockton, we're about to begin eight more exaflops. Uh, I think there'll be more after that um, in the U.S. Um, it, it's been an extraordinary run. Uh, 
Tell us a little bit about, go ahead. Thank you. It's been an incredible journey for us it, as well. It's been an extraordinary run. Um, you, you, G42, uh, as the national champion, has global engagements. Uh, there's been uh, published re reports on, on partnership with India, with the Indian government, uh, announcements of work with uh, one of the green AI providers, uh, green infrastructure providers in Africa. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about what's going on as you're sort of expanding around the globe? For us, it's about democratizing the access, not just to the infrastructure, but to the intelligence that we can deliver jointly. And in order for us to get on this journey, we need to have a geographic expansion. And I will say that developing artificial intelligence is difficult. Developing artificial intelligence at scale is very difficult. Developing artificial intelligence with financial discipline is extremely <laughs> difficult. So when we look at how we can go and grow our footprint internationally in the purpose of us delivering democratized access to artificial intelligence, we need to be very mindful in terms of where we deploy our precious resources, our human experts to support the growth that we need. And we look at markets that are mainly underserved to a large extent, but markets that have tremendous potential. So one of the examples that I want to give is Kenya. So in Kenya, very um, recently, we've announced a partnership with a company called EcoCloud. And I don't know how many of you know what is the median age in Africa. Anyone? Bueller? It's 18 years, 18.8. .8. So Africa is an extremely young continent. And people who are extremely ambitious, innovative, and eager to deliver um, the results that will surpass the expectations of, of uh, people who are not familiar with what's happening there. And the other thing that is very interesting about Kenya is that in Kenya, we have the opportunity to leverage geothermal energy for the data centers that we're building there. So this is the greenest form of us powering our data centers and our AI infrastructure and delivering capabilities from traditional cloud computing to AI accelerators to digital transformation programs in order to enable a very ambitious population um, in Kenya to embrace and really innovate. Because the idea here is really for us to eliminate the barriers eliminate the friction and harness the power of artificial intelligence that is limited only by human imagination. So that's the, that's the strategy cool. there. And um, we're going to grow um, as aggressively as we can. Um, and we're super excited. The idea here is really to turn intelligence into a utility. And then just to, to, to wrap up, not only are you expanding in Africa, in the Middle East, um, but I saw, uh, and I got to meet your, your new US engineering leader. Uh, you're growing here too. You want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So AI infrastructure is exciting, but having the infrastructure without the best talent that you can employ is useless. So we're trying. Don't don't tell them that. It's still good. It's still a good idea. Go ahead. <laughs> we're trying very hard to find the best and the brightest in the world and work with them, whether they're part of our organization, where they're part of our um, technology partners organizations. But we are super excited and interested 
in growing our presence in the US. So we've been very fortunate in the last couple of months to hire a couple of very senior technologists based on the West Coast of uh, United States. And we'll be opening an office in the um, very near future here in the Bay Area. If you're interested in working with us, if you're interested in partnering with us, please reach out to, to Andrew, to myself. We're always available. Between ourselves, we have 24 hours of coverage for sure. <laughs> And uh, the last thing is what we have with Condor Galaxy 1, Condor Galaxy 2, and now 3 is going to be available for usage as well. So if you're interested to experiment with the platform, if you're interested to build fantastic models, you can go and um, register your interest on condorgalaxy.ai. That's the website that... Uh, we're using it's fairly basic but it will allow you to register your interest and the alternative is just to drop an email to any of our team members thank you carol by, by way of wrapping up when you start a company uh, you, you aspire to, to to move the world a little bit right you you gather up your friends and the, your favorite people to work with and you say, is our idea worth investing six or eight years of our life behind? And uh, along the way, you, you encounter others who you, uh, you want to invest bits of your career with. And when I sit here, and this is our first one of these, when I see all you guys here, I want to say, say thank you for being interested in this adventure. Many of you uh, I see in the audience today, uh, I first presented to when, when there were seven of us and we had a PowerPoint. And uh, you, you've stayed engaged and, and followed us. And it means so much to us to, to see you here and to feel your support. And I really say thank you for the whole team. And we're looking forward to seeing you next year. So be well, everybody.